Soon after arriving in Bloemfontein, Emily was approached by a distinguished Boer lady, a Mrs. Feckhardt, who, knowing of Emily's purpose, invited her to stay in her home. Then, Emily presented herself before the British military governor for the whole Orange Free State, General Prettyman. He was most gallant and gave her a permanent pass to the refugee camp. And your suggestions will be carefully considered. Oh. And uh, I will be glad to hear what you think of the camp. Oh, thank you, General. I had hoped that you would stay here at Government House. Oh. But unfortunately, we are in the midst of a bout of time. <laughs> well. And the place is overrun. <laughs> as you can see with doctors and nurses. Oh, well, don't worry yourself, General. I am most fortunate in being the guest of Mrs. Fickard. Not uh, surely the Mrs. A. Fickard? Yes. Oh, dear lady. But she is very bitter against us British. Just so, General. But my visit may have a softening effect on her. Mrs. Fickard. I hope you were right, Miss Hobhouse. Please. And then Emily set off for the Bloemfontein refugee camp outside of the simple capital, carrying with her a selection of supplies and for her protection from the African sun, a parasol. The sights that greeted her were far worse than she had bargained for. She had presumed that the British authorities would have provided the women and children with the essentials for human survival. She would merely work to provide the basic extras. But the women and children were desperately short of water, almost bereft of any fuel, and generally totally uncared for. There were about 2,000 human beings living in tents, sleeping on the uncovered earth, even expectant mothers and children. As she stood in one of those tents, a lethal puffer appeared from under the canvas. She gave the deadly snake a solid whack with her English lady's parasol. Now, she had seen for herself, and quite a few other creatures Human were about to receive a whack from her till they learned to mend their ways. Indeed, at that time, here in Bloemfontein, Emily declared a second war in South Africa between her maiden self and the Tory government back in England that didn't want to know about innocent suffering while they were engaged in conquest for power and gold. Emily listened to the endless tragedies. My husband and three sons left me to fight the English in October 1899. My eldest boy, 21 years, was killed in January. How I felt the hand of cruel war. Yet not once have I regretted that he went to fight for his dear country. Yes, for his own country. Bought with the blood of forefathers, which the cruel English money seekers want to take from us. The Boer women in the camps were also getting angry at the guilty mendacity of the British authorities. One woman, a Mrs. Moll, stated, the British say we asked them for protection, which is a falsehood. We never did anything of the kind. Then she set about doing what she could for the hard-pressed women and children. Methodically, she handed out her supplies of food and clothes. She threatened the British authorities that if they did not act compassionately for their victims, she would hold them personally and publicly responsible for the deaths that were happening all around her. The military governor, General Prettyman, anxiously provided Emily with a bucket for each tent in the camp. Unbelievably, 
that was a big step forward. And she insisted that he issued a proclamation stating that all drinking water must be boiled. And therefore, he had to produce fuel to carry out that job. General Prettyman was beginning to capitulate completely under Emily's onslaught, or as uh, far as he was able, he ordered a British military captain to be at Emily's disposal to carry out whatever she thought should be done. Prettyman uh, made some money available, and finally he asked Emily... Perhaps you would give me a shopping list of your requirements, dear lady. Oh, certainly. A wash house with running water and soap. Forage for cows, medical supplies, and trained nurses. Emily personally acquired mattresses and sacking, and she produced an engine boiler big enough to hold all of the drinking water. Now Emily's parasol was truly gone and her Victorian sleeves were rolled up. What a strange image she was. A lone English woman representing the virtues of her nation, surrounded by the evil that same nation had created. Of course, saints are rare enough anywhere, amongst any people. Emily never showed her distress to the suffering victims. But to a friend, she stated. It is so pathetic. I think I came from England with magic powers to set them free. It's dreadful to explain. There's no chance of that. And she wrote a letter. I call this camp system wholesale cruelty. It can never be wiped out from the memories of the people. It presses hardest on the children. If only the English people would try to exercise a little imagination and picture the whole miserable scene. Entire villages and districts rooted up and dumped in a strange, bare place. To keep these camps going is murder for the children. All around her was death. She reported. Next, I was called to see a woman panting in the heat, just sickening for a confinement. Next tent, a little six months old baby gasping its life out on its mother's knee. Two or three others drooping and sick in that tent. Next, a girl of 24 lay dying on a stretcher. Her father, a big, gentle boor, kneeling beside her. While in the next tent, his wife was watching a child of six, also dying. I can't describe what it is like to see these children lying about in a state of collapse. It's just exactly like faded flowers thrown away. And then Emily decided to visit refugee camp south of Bloemfontein, she being refused permission to travel north by Lord Kitchener himself. She travelled without the aid of the military. Indeed, now that her compassion for the Boer people was beginning to make itself known, the British military were already beginning to look on her as a kind of a pariah. But she didn't lose her sense of humor. As she traveled, she wrote, I should do much better here if I was shaped like a truck and ran on wheels. Springfontein camp was even worse. Destitution and death. Emily made the truth quite clear. She stated, It is hollow and rotten to the heart's core to have made all over the state large, uncomfortable communities of people 
whom you call refugees and say you are protecting, but who call themselves prisoners of war. Women and children, compulsorily detained and detesting your protection. Traveling for this Victorian rector's daughter was now extremely tough. Occasionally, she was able to undress at night and sleep in the guard's van of a train. But her face was indomitable. Only once did her deep feminine sensitivity get the better of her Cornish stoicism. One night, a railway station officer offered her his bath and his bed, while he, the good gentleman, slept in a railway van. Emily has confessed that she burst into tears. No doubt later and in total privacy. Miss Hobhouse did not confine all of her love to the Boer people. Uh, she related how one day a British Tommy came to her door. Good afternoon, ma'am. Can you spare a drop of boiled water? Um, where are you from, young man? Oh, I used to live in Somerset. Oh, fancy that. I'm from Cornwall. We're neighbors. I don't half miss Somerset. If I'd known what I know now, I'd never have gone to war. I'd never go to war again. Would you like to share my cocoa? Oh, that would be a treat. I've been in hospital. And now I'm sleeping in six inches of water. Drink up your cup. Thank you. I never go to war again. Drink it up. Emily now decided that she must return to Cape Town to seek permission to visit the refugee camps, which are now being called concentration camps, northward at Kronstadt and Mafeking. But here in uh, Cape Town, an organization calling itself the Guild of Loyal Women, expatriate British women, were working hard against her. And they reported their opinion to, amongst others, the governor. Emily Hobhouse has sown discontent and dissatisfaction among the Boer women. These Boer women were all satisfied and indeed grateful to the English government until she came amongst them and taught them to invent grievances where none existed. At the time of this English female statement, the mortality figures in the British concentration camps had been officially accepted as... The October mortality of the concentration camps has reached 346.72 per 1,000. For the aggregate. And over here in Britain, the whole bitter truth was beginning to seep through. The British Army had uh, virtually overrun both of the Boer republics in the conventional military sense. But we British were far, far from victory and peace. Probably about 25,000 mounted Boers were still raiding and ambushing the vast British army very efficiently all over southern Africa. And that dilemma was sucking the British further and further into nightmarish reprisals. Here in England, there was an uneasy mixture of jingoistic shouting on the one hand and expressions of self-loathing on the other. The problem was, the Boers 
would simply not stop fighting. The Commandant General of the Transvaal, Louis Bota, had explained the Boers' reason for continuing the fight very clearly to the British Commander-in-Chief. I can only protest against your measures as being in opposition to all principles of civilized warfare and excessively cruel towards the women and children. But I desire to give you the assurance that nothing you may do against the women and children will deter us from continuing the struggle for our independence. And Emily Hobhouse, as an English person, was now very much on her own amongst her own people. The Lieutenant Governor of what had been the Orange Free State, a certain Major Sir Hamilton Gould Adams, confronted our heroine. Miss Hobhouse, it has been reported to me that you have shown personal sympathy with the Boers when doling out clothes and food. But that is precisely what I came to do, to give personal sympathy and help in personal troubles. Nevertheless, Emily managed to wheedle permission to visit the concentration camp at Mafeking. However, the British governor at the Cape uh, wrote ominously to his boss in England, Joseph Chamberlain. Miss Hobhouse exercises a bad influence on the poor women. In the refugee camps. Oh dear. The British were quietly preparing the crucifixion of Miss Hobhouse. And she, after her work at Mather King and being allowed to go no further, decided innocently to return to Britain to rouse her nation to remorse of many, many horrific facts. On arrival in London, Emily went to see the Tory Secretary of State for War, St. John Broderick, at the War Office. Mr. Broderick had recently chanced his temerity by standing up in the House of Commons and quoting Lord Kitchener in South Africa. He um, categorically states, quote, the Boer women and children in the concentration camps have a sufficient allowance and are all comfortable and happy, unquote. Mr. Broderick no doubt hoped and prayed that he could keep uh, Emily's mouth shut. Emily asked the Secretary of War for humane improvements to the camps. Broderick, like the slippery politician he was, more or less agreed. Ah, if there is no objection from the military, naturally. And the military, of course, now meant brutal Kitchener. Emily um, walked out of the war office two hours later, and uh, sensing what she was up against, she began to bombard every member of the Houses of Parliament with her terrible facts. A few brave allies stood by her side. A remarkable proportion of them were Celts. Indeed, uh, Emily herself stated, I am a Celt, and therefore am also a member of an oppressed race. The Welsh Celt, David Lloyd George, reminded Joseph Chamberlain, The Herod of old sought to crush a little race, the Jewish people by killing all the young children. It was not a success. And I would commend that story to Herod's 
modern imitator. Rubbish! And then the Irish Celt, in the person of John Dillon, stood up in the House of Commons and addressed Queen Victoria herself. We humbly represent to Her Majesty that the wholesale burning of farmhouses, the driving of women and children out of their homes without shelter or proper provision of food, and the confinement of those women and children in prison camps are practices not in accordance with the usages of war as recognized by civilized nations. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That such proceedings are in the highest degree disgraceful brother, and dishonoring to a nation Go back to Ireland. Professing to be Christian. Hmm. But uh, then, of course, the Irishman Dillon was deeply aware of the exploitation and often brutality by the English in his own country, Ireland, for over 700 dreadful years. One really can't complain about him being so outspoken. And finally, the normally docile Scotsman, Sir Henry Campbell Bannerman, leader of the Liberal Party, spoke the hard truth. Chamberlain and company were beginning to wobble and were bleating as an excuse well, war is war. Campbell Bannerman stated, a phrase often used now is, war is war. But when one comes to ask about it, one is told that no war is going on in South Africa, that it is not a real war. When is a war not a war? when it is carried on by methods of barbarism Rubbish. in South Africa. Shame, Shame, on you, sir. Shame on you, sir. Bannerman's words, methods of barbarism, rang around a shocked world. Non-British nations put their diplomacy aside and openly expressed their abhorrence. Not always, of course, without monumental hypocrisy, but it was a bad international press for Britain. Emily Hobhouse was now a marked woman in Britain. She had published her opinions, and the London Times, the Thunderer, moved ponderously to attack her and what she stood for. An editorial read, Miss Hobhouse's pamphlet as a weapon of party warfare. It's been used as such a weapon wherever the name of England is hated. Even in the dynamite press of America. Emily travelled all over Britain fighting her cause. Daily she was attacked. Everywhere she was called a traitor to her nation. But Lloyd George asked, is every person who opposes a war during its progress of necessity a traitor? If so, the great Lord Chatham was a traitor. And Burke and Fox especially. And in later times, Cobden and Bright. All of these truly great men were traitors. Emily never lost her guard in front of her British enemies, but uh, she privately confessed to the wife of President Steyn in uh, South Africa 
My work for the camps in South Africa has brought nearly all my own people to look on me with contempt and suspicion. The press has singled me out and I am branded a rebel, a liar, and an enemy of my own people. <laughs> this has done much to sour my life. I'm banned from society. People turn away when my name is mentioned. However, Emily was indestructible. She again went to see Mr. Broderick at the war office. Sir, I wish to go back to the concentration camps in South Africa. Ah, uh, I am afraid that is now impossible, Miss, Miss Hobhouse. Oh. May I know the government's reasons for this refusal? Well, we have selected a committee of ladies to inspect the concentration camps, and they should be as far as is possible, removed from any suspicion of, of partiality. Now, it would be impossible for the government to accept uh, your services in South Africa because your reports and speeches have uh, been made the subject of uh, so much uh, controversy. <laughs> Emily wrote a letter to Broderick. The repulse to myself would have mattered nothing had only a large band of kindly workers been instantly dispatched. Instead, a whole month passed while six ladies were chosen. During that month, 576 children The preparation and journey of these ladies occupied yet another month, and in that interval, 1,124 more children succumbed. Instead of at once proceeding to the great centers of high mortality, yet a third month seems to have been spent in their journey to Mafeking. And in that month, 1,546 more children died. In the name of the children whom I have watched suffer and die, I make bold to plead with you once again. I urge that immediate steps be taken to act, lest one day we be bowed down by the humiliating and grievous thought that we have sat.